We want to welcome you to Lighthouse Fellowship Church Wednesday night Bible study. And we're here in Salina, Ohio, 817 North Sugar Street. We hope you can follow us uh, and find us on the live, uh, live stream. And, and those of you that are uh, here we, uh, on live stream, we want to thank you for tuning in with us. And those of you that are here in person, we're so glad you're here. We've got some, some uh, kids here in, in service with us tonight and teenagers that are uh, wanting to be here with the adults tonight, so we're glad to have you, okay? So you feel free to just say what you want to say, answer questions, ask questions, okay? And we are in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Carlene had an appointment at the James Center yesterday, and, um, you know, I don't know if she has anything to say. Carlene, got anything to say about that? In the kitchen. Yes? But she's busy right now. Carol, Jane, Jane's sister, is visiting us from Arizona? No, this is from Southern Indiana. Southern Indiana, okay. I, she's got quite a few sisters. I got them all. But anyway, this is Carol here. We're glad to have you with us, Carol. And Sylvia, Carlene's sister, is with us tonight. And she's going to be doing the children's church. And so she's getting things ready down there. And, uh, and th those of you that are up here, you go right ahead and eat and enjoy the fellowship and the food. And we want to thank Bonnie because she made a dish that smells really good. And so afterwards, Terry, we'll get to try it, okay? Right. But uh, Bonnie made what crock pot pizza. But she said it's also called cavatini, I think. So anyway, it smells good. I'm anxious to try it. And so we've got salad, we've got garlic bread. It sounds like the works. Now we're ready to get into chapter 11, Terry. So uh, why don't you open us with a word of prayer? Okay. Grace is Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this evening and for bringing those online as well. We just pray, Father, that you would uh, bless everyone here and uh, the food that we have uh, just smells wonderful, Lord. And we just thank you for being able to have our senses and smell. We also, Lord, want to just ask that the Holy Spirit just kind of come around us and uh, to use the Word to educate us and help us follow us to learn much from this series as we are reading. Use it all for your glory, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, well, just a couple things to say about the church. I am appointing trustees, three of them. I'll tell you who they are. Mike Harden, James Richmond, and Steve Hay. So those are the three that you know, I can count on them. I know they've always been able to help. And so I'm going to point them, and then we're gonna we'll have a business meeting with, uh, probably next week. I'll get things prepared for that business meeting. But uh, you know what? We are moving forward. Hey, we've gotten some things done thanks to these guys that are helping. And Terry, you have been so beneficial to fill in for me and do whatever you need to do and be right there for the Bible studies. I am so thankful for you. And so we God is giving us some good help. We, of course, we've got a good kitchen committee now, those of you that pitch in and do what needs to be done, we want to thank you for that. And so uh, moving forward, uh, the the men helped me to get these light bulbs changed and put new covers on the, they've been here forever, and the new covers are so bright and, and cheery in here now. And I've got the windows replaced that the, some kids in the neighborhood broke out. That looks really good. So, hey, we feel good about our church. We move forward with our church, and God's going to bring more people in. And I'm, I'm excited about it. All right, now, Terry, you go right ahead and start where you want, and I will uh, just chime in whenever you need me. Well, we're going to start here at verse 10. Uh, just a little bit about what we've been reading. Uh, it says, with an irony that marks the chapter 11, Paul asks the Corinthians to bear with him as he takes on the foolish portion of these false apostles. Uh, they have been such an influence to the Corinthians with that, that it's actually subverted some of the God-given authority of Paul. So that's kind of what we're dealing with right now, is Paul is having to, you know, sometimes in a sarcastic way, validate his authenticity, validate his credentials. So that's kind of where we are with this. And we're going to get into a in much deeper uh, force of him as he goes through the, uh, some of these other verses. Uh, he's really going to 
not so much make a fool out of himself, but in a way that he's just acknowledging what he has gone through, and it's all for Jesus Christ. His scars are all, but he says, because of Jesus, by that, and he continues on. So let's continue on here with verse 10 in chapter 11. We'll go through the first six, uh, next six verses here. As the truth of Christ in me, is in me, no man shall stop me to, of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein thy, they glory, they may be found even as we, as such a, are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, those whose end shall be according to their works. So, if we were prior, actually there when this was going on, we would definitely probably hear Paul's voice picking up a few decibels on that. He was being pretty firm with this. <coughs> It says, as a true apostle, Paul could boast that he took no money and that he was more interested in the integrity of the message of his own needs than, than his actually own needs. That. So in verse 11 where it says, uh, wherefore, because I do not love you, God knows, Paul's boasting is the weakness of unimpressive image was an embarrassment to the Corinthian Christians. Let me, let me explain something there, Terry, while you're reading that. Uh, and we're reading it in the King James Version, and or whatever Bible you got. We have to realize he's asking a question. Why? It says, as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of time. So he's saying he's boasting, but he's unwillingly has to tell what his commendations are about of, of serving as an apostle and like you said he's not he doesn't want to have to say it but he's kind of forced to say it because these people are caring more some they've heard more about secular people uh and their the way that they're approaching the false gods and the way they're speaking because they're pretty elegant speakers and paul goes ahead and talks about he said i i don't pretend to be elegant i don't want to be that way i may be rude in speech verse six says but not in knowledge but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. And let me just move back to that. So he's saying, I'm, you may be think of me as rude. Maybe I'm not an eloquent speaker like some of these other people that speak on Mars Hill. And by the way, he did speak on Mars Hill as an orator as an, that invited to be there. Because that's what they did a lot. They spoke on, they spoke on topics. They talked about them. They argued about them. And they thought it was great fun. And they tried to show their intelligence. And Paul wasn't about that, was he? Not, no. so, not bragging about his intelligence. He didn't want to do that. But, but he has to be pretty blunt with them. He said, why am I doing this? He said, as the truth of Christ is in me. He said, this is what I'm about, the truth of Christ. No man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. So in other words, if I have to tell you what my credentials are and what God has given me to do, I will do it. And he's saying, because, why? Because I love you not? Is it because I don't love you that I'm doing this? He said, God knows. Well, of course we know he loves you. Yeah, but he's saying, it's not because, it's because God knows. I'm doing it because I love you, not because I don't love you. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. He said there's a lot of people out there doing it in a false way, trying to get glory for themselves, and I'm doing it because I really do love you, and I love what God wants me to do. God knows all about this. So now I'll turn it back over to you. Here. I wasn't sure if they were getting it because the way they're written, wherefore, because I love yeah. you not, it almost sounds like, no, I don't love you. Because I don't love you, I'm saying it. No, it's, it's like you said, sarcasm. But I don't know if everybody that reads it picks up on that sarcasm that he's using right there. He's saying, I, you think I'm doing this because I don't love you? Of course not. I'm, I'm doing this because I do love you. 
of course, the Corinthian people had a lot going on in their lives and had a lot of bad influences. So I think Paul knew that. Go ahead, Terry. Well, Paul also didn't want to embarrass the, the, these Corinthians, but that if that was what he was going to do to be effective, and that's what he did, was to embarrass them. Um, also with us, it, it talks about few modern Christians want to deal with the fact that there are false apostles and deceitful workers also among Corinthian, also also among modern day Christians as well. So we have to be careful there. It's dangerous territory when you have to go ahead and point out that there's false preachers, prophets out there, and some people just might not want to hear it. There's some people that are doing the wrong things even in our day and preaching the wrong things and talking to preaching a watered down gospel where people can't even see enough of it to accept the Lord or be saved. But and you can see that's probably some of what was happening right here, uh, where they were deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, when some of them weren't even apostles of Christ. Yeah. Right? And that, isn't that what he's inferring right here, mm -hmm. Terry, do you think? Go ahead. Yeah, it's with, with apostles, I think we talked a little bit last week, that apostles were sent by God, but these false apostles just came to Corinth. And what do you think their, their reasoning was behind the, the false apostles coming? Do you think they were getting self-gain, self-glory? He kind of eludes to that, that wherein they glory. Yeah, glorify themselves. Yes. Yeah. For themselves. And their, you know, their appearance, they, they were elegant speakers. So that was a real attraction for the Corinthian Christians with that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to Paul. You know, Paul was just straightforward and spoke the scriptures, delivered a bold message. With that, but, so, you, know, really wasn't, you know, from what we read, it really wasn't impressive to look at. But that, but it was the message; it was the key point. In fact, he admitted here that he might even to them appear to be rude in speech. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's kind of blunt. And but you know, uh, when people tell you the truth, it brings about shame. But you get people that are doing it for their own glory, or their own gain, and being deceitful. What are they going to accomplish? Yeah. And there are many churches these days who want to just, you know, talk about the fluff and not the hard stuff. You know, and that, you know, that, that kind of, you know, you're, they want to get an audience in there as opposed to they want to get followers of Jesus Christ. And that's, you know, I think that's where we get into some false uh, apostles in that way or false uh, messengers. But that, that makes a difference. And you know, for my cherry, it seems like a lot of the churches are, are their desire is to try to be mega churches. But if you read if you read about statistics now, and, and it's been this way for a long time, let me ask you a question. I wonder if anybody really knows the answer. And this was these were statistics that were given not too long ago. That among the real evangelistic, the ones that are evangelistic, real Christian churches, let's say among the Christian churches that are preaching Christ, Him crucified, and salvation. What would you say the average size of the church is for those churches? For the big mega churches? No, no, I'm talking about overall. What is the size of the Christian churches? That overall, what if you took them all together and you... Small churches and churches. Small churches, churches and churches. 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 What's the average? average? What would be the average? Okay. Actually, Everybody average else? What? Average church size. Church size of members? All together, yeah. Churches that are coming. People that are coming in the congregation. What's the average size? He says 50. Anybody else got another guess? What? I'd say that's 35. Real close. I'd say 35. 75. 75. That's it. 75 is the average size of evangelistic churches. Real Christian churches. Now, that doesn't mean that the mega churches aren't out there and they, they may make the, the number go up a point or two. But when you think about it, the mega churches, there's a whole lot more small churches of 75 member congregations that all over the world that really are the body of Christ. Now, the mega churches, you've got a few here and there. But when you think about all the mega churches we've got, you put them all together. It really doesn't come close to all the churches that we have that are 75 and under. Because that's the average size of the congregational church, of, of congregations. So anyway, anybody surprised about that? It doesn't, it doesn't really seem surprising. Well, that's why back in them days they had to be housed out. There yeah. was persecution. That's 
true. And that's where they started. The church they started, they started, they started they house to house. Now, they were sometimes able to use temples uh, and get in there and speak. They were invited to speak at some of the temples and so on. But as soon, uh, many times when they found out they were preaching Christ, if it was a Jewish temple, of course, they, they turned away from it pretty fast. And, and, but there were people that were saved even when the preaching was uh, done in the Jewish temples too. Paul was, saw some success, some success that way. But, uh, but that's a good point. A lot of them were house churches. In fact, this was a house church right here, where we are right here. This was a house. They were meeting here as a church. And then the family decided, hey, you know what? We're going to donate this land, this house, to the church that we're going to, which happens to be right here. And then they grew, and they this became the church. They revamped it a little bit. Then when they grew to the point this didn't hold them, then they went ahead and built the sanctuary next door. And finally they outgrew that one. And they're still going strong. But it's because one family saw the need. I just think it's interesting because a lot of times churches do start. Does anybody know where Lighthouse Fellowship Church started? Our church. Somebody tell me where it started. It didn't actually start there. But that was one of the first locations. That was actually about the second. That was the third location. Where was the first location? Anybody know? My dad's living. Who said that? Yeah, my dad's living. Is that what you were going to say? I was going to say Sydney. Oh, no, no. It was right here. My father was a deacon, uh, one of the first deacons of our church, the first deacon of our church right here. And so, yes, it started in his living room. Then it moved over to uh, uh, on the corner of uh, Blake and Walnut. New Life Christian Center were not using their sanctuary because it was a second floor sanctuary. They built another building. And they were just using that building as office space. And they allowed us to use that sanctuary free. What do you think about that? Didn't have to pay anything. They just said, we're glad you started. We want to help you out. And we went up there. The problem was, it was there were 18 stairs. And we lost a couple of elderly couples. They just couldn't climb the stairs. The corner of Lake and Walnut. Well, when we realized that, yeah, that's the old Nazarene church. Yeah, that it is. Originally, it was a Nazarene church. Uh -huh. Then they bought it, and it became an office space. They probably had the church there for a while, up on that second floor. Yeah. And then after that, they built out there on uh, what twenty nine or thirty three going out of town. Twenty nine. What? Was it Haverman Road? Yeah. They don't have them in Road. Joe Right. So now let's move from there. We they we went from there to where? Did anybody else know where we went next? You mentioned it. You remember what that place was? That was a bike shop or something. A motorcycle, Yoey's motorcycle shop. They was uh, he had uh, closed it down and sold it. Actually, he passed away, and uh, I think uh, his family then sold it to uh, somebody, and he rented it. Uh, his name was King. In fact. The guy that we got that we rented the motorcycle shop from was the son of the man that let us use the sanctuary upstairs in the New Life Christian Center. Isn't that neat? And so we were there at the motorcycle shop. What's that? It was Mark King. Mark King. That's right. And his, by the way, his wife Angie is running for what state representative, and she's a good Christian. She stood there and talked and did a wonderful job at the pro life. Uh, or the pro-life uh, rally we had in Court Square. Of course, there were eight people that were out there with a megaphone trying to disrupt it who were not pro-life. But you know what? It went very well. I just say we progress. You can see sometimes it takes a series of steps for a church to become what God wants it to be. And so we're still moving forward. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a little bit of a struggle at times. But that's... Uh, that's really not off topic because this is what was going on with Corinth. They had you you know they started with a with a house church. That's what they did back then. And they would start with the house church. We don't know whether they ever did get a building or whatever. They probably did some location because they were growing. And as you grow, you do have to make some accommodations and make it possible for people to be able to come and bring their friends and so on. But that was a motorcycle shop that had uh, been sold and then we turned it into a church. Actually, another church was using it for us and then, and then they moved away and then we moved in right there. So.
Then after that, this building came open right here, these two buildings. And God worked it out for us to get it. We had the opportunity to buy this building when they moved out of this one, when Abounding Grace moved out of here and built that sanctuary. They ran out of room, so then they went out of 1.7. We had the we had the opportunity to buy it right then from that church. Anybody know why we didn't buy it? Can you, huh? Well, there was another church in this building that was using the Korean church. But they weren't interested in buying it because they didn't have the money. Anybody know why we didn't buy it? We were only a young church. We didn't have the money either. <laughs> we didn't have the money. And so it came to be that somebody else bought it, and they bought it to flip, and the flip didn't go. And so he was going to sell it to an organization, and then he went ahead and rented it to us, well, sold it to us on that contract, and now we've got it, went to the bank and got it in our name. So now we're buying it through the bank. And it's, it's our church. And I'm glad it's working out that way. But, but when we think about that, that's a little bit of the history of the church. In case, how many of you knew any of this? Did any of you know much of this? Kind of scattered? Oh, of course Carlene knows. Yeah? Okay. So now you've got a little bit of history. And uh, so we're, we're seeing a church like, like ours, Corinth, was, it's full of new believers. Many of them were new believers. In fact, these were new churches because Paul had just been going through there with three missionary journeys. He was going through and starting churches. So these were new church starts. And so you know that they didn't have all the things that they needed. But they had Paul and some of the apostles coming in and preaching. And if you got that, you've got a church, right? And you're bringing the gospel to people and people are listening. Now, what did I interrupt you right now, Terry? Oh, kind of in between verse 13 and 14. Okay. So Paul was not in it then to impress anybody, was he? But some of those people that they had been listening to before, and maybe even during the time that Paul is growing this church, were actually listening to things and being impressed by some of these false apostles, the deceitful workers they were tra who transformed themselves into apostles of Christ. Some people will do anything to get a to get a, an audience. And these people, it's, according to what it's saying here, they were trying to look like they were apostles of, apostles of Christ, which means they were not apostles of Christ. They were deceiving people, and uh, they were false apostles. So now, go ahead, Terry. I was going to say, verses 14 and 15, Paul starts explaining that these false apostles are actually transforming themselves much like Satan transforms himself in here. So if we go through here, it says, even Satan may appear as an angel of light. So false apostles may be in a good appearance. Because Paul is showing the Corinthian Christians how foolish it is to rely on image and outward appearance. You know, so Satan can come in, you know, Satan, Satan was a beautiful angel at that time. So that was the appearance, but we really know the inside of what Satan's all about. Well, you've got to so, test the spirit. What's that? Yeah, test, test the spirit. spirit. You've got to test the first oh, spirit. Oh, yeah. Test, test the, the spirit. spirit. Yeah. Right. So what's coming out of our mouth, why look at the They can appear, like, like it says here, deceitful. They can transform themselves to look like they are maybe an apostle of Christ. And, and Satan, can try to, he tries to make himself look like an angel of light. And I'm sure he's fooled a lot of people over the years. And so, and he continues to do that, too. What's that? Well, yeah. Right from the very beginning. I would have, yeah, I'd say, if you walk with God, you got to be, you know, that's, that's saying a lot. When you think about that. But it was the, but who did that? Who, who was the one that gave in to Satan, though? What did Adam say to God? And he said, why did you do this? What did I do? He what? She gave him that fruit. He blamed the woman. Well, I don't know why you think of the way he's not blaming God. She's, he's the one who gave her. That's right. true. Right. When you think about it, well, this is, he, he were lonely. Man was lonely. It's not good for man to be alone. So he made a, a woman. And then that woman, what her excuse was what? What was her excuse? The serpent. The serpent. She blamed the serpent. Well, it's the serpent was behind it. But, I mean, that just goes to show you. What were you saying, James? It's just that he blamed her. Very much blamed God. Very much blamed 
<laughs> you know, I like that you brought that out. Has anybody really thought about what he's saying right there? When you're, when you're saying that when you're blaming God for something he's done for you, and you're using him as an excuse, I mean, what, or something he's done as an excuse, you're blaming God. That's That goes a little bit deeper than on the surface. You know? Yeah, I can see that happens a lot, doesn't it? So Terry, go ahead. Wait a minute. And no marvel. So Paul's saying it's no big surprise here that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. I like the way he said that, don't you? And also, you know, it's, sometimes it can be difficult to identify evil unless it just jumps out right at you with that. So it's really important to be able to discern. It says, but this approach of, of appearances will end up in embarrassing Satan himself. It says, whoever performs himself into an angel of light says, if Satan were to appear before a human audience, they would strongly be tempted to worship him as a creature almost of divine beauty. I've just gotten to read saying a little bit about that. Says, so even if it is foolish for Corinthian Christians, it is also foolish for, for us today to be taken by an image of outward appearance. So just kind of wake us up here and realize we need to be on our guard too. And everything we hear and what we see and even what we see on TV or see on the internet, we need to be careful. Well, since you brought that out, Terry, some of you have heard some TV evangelists, and some of them are what kind of speaker? They may not, they may come across as a Christian type speaker, but there's another word for them too. Positive. Well, charismatic. Uh, by the way, charismatic means somebody that draws other people. It doesn't mean you know, any kind of spiritual theology. So that's, but, but, they, but when they, we, we say, when we say that somebody, um, uh, a positive speaker, what do you call them? Yeah, there, there's a word for it. Speaker? Motivational speakers. And many motivational speakers try to bring themselves across as a Christian speaker. Now listen, anybody that is a Christian and tries to preach to a congregation the way God wants them to, they are bound to motivate people. I mean, that, that's what happens. But sometimes that's not their uh, object to, or objective is to motiv motivate Christians to do necessarily God's will. Some of them have other motivations. What would you say some of the motivations are that they have if they're motivational speakers? Money. 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 That's a big one right there. Or and bring, bring you in for something else that they want to sell you. Power. And what? Bring, they want to try to bring you in for something else that they want to sell you. Kind of in a secondary meeting. MLMs, multiple listings, <laughs> marketing. Marketing. <laughs> well, yeah, what can we, let's drum this up. Let's see what we can make out of this. And so I believe, honestly, I believe a lot of the televangelists that got caught up into that thing, I think some of them were actually sincere at first. But then it becomes a corporation of people. And then you've got a board that wants to tell him what he needs to do, how he can make some money for the church and all this stuff. And before you know it, it's a snowball that he can't stop. Yeah, it's not built on biblical principles. That's, and that's the case right there, if you're and not building biblical principles. You, you, look, you, can, you can tell there's a place on the internet that tells you who are the richest pastors or evangelists <laughs> in the world. And you'd be amazed. I don't think I want to know. Right at the top. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, and people being rich in this world doesn't mean they're rich in God's eyes. Yeah. If we're rich in this world's goods, that doesn't mean anything. It's about you know, what our rewards in heaven. And God said we won't have our rewards. Anybody else have anything you want to share about this right now? One of the televangelists you see on TV, if they were going around, okay, you see these people on TV. Or, um, they're going around dressed like homeless people, telling people God's coming in. Nobody ever listens to them. They persecute them. But somebody comes like this minister in a suit, no evangelist. Everybody wants to hear what they say. That's not even true. A lot of times it's about appearance. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's about the appearance uh, of. But you got somebody people. telling you something plain and simple. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a guy come to me one time. He was new in the area, and he had taken a church, and um, he was going around meeting all the pastors. He said, 
And I was sitting here in my suit and tie. I mean, you know what? As a hospice chaplain for over 15 years, probably 20 altogether, because I was I was uh, doing it voluntary, and then they said, we want you on staff. And so we did that, and Marlene volunteered to sing with me sometimes. And, but anyway, uh, as doing that, and, and I realized, as busy as I was, and we had a growing church, and it was very busy. It wasn't this church, it was another one. Uh, but uh, he came to me and he said, you know what, I don't wear a suit and tie. He said, I don't feel like we need to wear a suit and tie to impress anybody. Uh, and I said, well, I'm glad you're comfortable in whatever you want to wear. But this happened to be my uniform because I never know when I have to go to the hospital, when I have to do a funeral. I mean, sometimes you get called as a pastor, you have to do things, and you have to be there for people. And I do want people to know that I'm a minister and that I'm here for this family, and I don't want to look like a bum when I'm trying to get things done for this family. With working with nurses and doctors and different, you know, I've gone, I've gone in and prayed with doctors in the, in the hospital rooms. They wanted to pray with me and, and the group there, the family. I mean, there's certain things you can, you can accomplish because of not being awkward, rude, or silly, you know, because sometimes you kind of have to look like you are somewhat of a person that has some respect for themselves and for God, and you want to bring an appearance that is not embarrassing to the people. Oh, that's my pastor. Uh, overlook how he looks. He looks like he drunk, just walked out of the bar, but that's our pastor. You know? you know what I'm saying? You have to be careful how you approach people and what you look like. Now, I don't have money to buy really good suits. In fact, I'm taking some old suits to Goodwill that I've got in my truck after church right now. And the new suits don't look any better than the old suits. But the size is different. <laughs> so I'm just saying you don't have to be rich to look presentable is the word right there. Be presentable. We should be presentable when we're trying to represent God. Uh, do, you, do you think if, if, uh, if Paul looked like he was just somebody that, like uh, John coming out of the wilderness in a loincloth, do you think they've invited him to preach on Mars Hill? No. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, even not just in the, you know, Christian society. I mean, in the world is everything. If you don't dress, like they say, for success or whatever, people look at you in a different way. Society has a view because that view is put up in, in media all the time. Right. And we, we have to be careful that we're not trying to please the public and other people right. by how our attire and how we dress. You know, God's Word says we should do all things in moderation. You can even wear a suit in moderation. You know, sometimes Carlene says mine are too much in moderation. Sometimes they don't even match. But but you know what? I'm a man. I have to say we don't always have that. You, can, you, you need to spot which one is going to be the, that you would think the pastor. And you, you know, you want to be accessible to those too. I mean... If you see somebody in a suit, of course, you're going to think maybe. Well, you might assume it's a pastor. I was down south, Carlene, doing our music down there, and I was with a BK, and he was uh, doing it. He had a sound studio, he was recording us. And and I went to church with him. He was hoping to get to sing, that we'd get to some of my songs, but there was already a program planned, an Easter program. It was it was uh, close to Easter. And But I said, it's okay, BK. I'm just glad that we can go to church together. And he was, he was happy we were there. And I was sitting there with him, and uh, he and his wife and Carlene were sitting together. And uh, I, he, I said, so who's the pastor? And she said, that, that guy back there in the white shirt. White shirt. And I looked back there, and they all, there was about five of them had white shirts. I couldn't tell which one the pastor was. So it isn't really about trying to be impressive. It's about being what God needs us to be, being comfortable with how God wants us to present his word, you know, the gospel, being moderate in all things. Now, if I came in with a diamond tie and, and I looked like a, a rhinestone cowboy or something, I'm going to up here to preach, it might... Well, <laughs> Carlene, you don't want me to look like that. Anyway. I said I would wear it. Oh, yeah, she would wear it. Yeah, she probably would. She does have a rhinestone tie. Oh, no, don't say Yeah, I bought her a cowboy hat. And a pearl tie. Okay, you're telling all that now. But anyway, but that's you've got you've got to really let God show you who you are. You can be moderate and not go over the top. As a pastor, 
You, know, you can be, you can be over the top. You know, evangelists can be over the top. And and so I was just listening to the radio today in a, a gospel program, and it was talking about this homeless guy. He had he could not get help at the home get, get, at the homeless place where they take people in to sleep because they don't have a place. The homeless house because he did not have an ID. Yeah. The police, the policeman that was that had brought him in, or no, he he had come into the police department. And they, he said, what, what is your problem? He said, I can't find a place to, to sleep. I don't have an ID. And I don't know where it's at. And they won't take me anywhere. And so he called around town and found a place for this homeless guy to sleep that night. And it didn't stop there. He came back. And, and the policeman helped him to get that ID that he needed. Now, how many people are out there, though, that don't have the ability to find a place to sleep at night? Some of them have already said, I've heard them say it, they want to be homeless. You know, they, they don't want to be obligated to anybody, anything. And they, they would rather beg or just have handouts. But my my uncle, I'll just tell you a little story. I know I'm all talking about I know I'm going to change the right the rubber trail, right? Okay, baby. But anyway, my uncle died. He was an alcoholic. He came to visit us. When he'd come to visit, he would usually find something upon it. Dad's or mom's. Upon that guitar I was playing. I hated that. <laughs> he lost it, he said, in a card game. But uh, but anyway, but you know, when he died, he didn't have a place to live. He died in Nashville under an overpass of hypothermia. All he had in his pockets was a New Testament, thank goodness, a little bit of money, just like a dollar and something. <clears throat> An application for McDonald's or someplace that he was going to go to and get some work so he could get a little bit of money so he could have a place to stay one night. And it, all that he had about his life fit in a little box about this big. Wow. That box came to me. My brother Mike had it. He went to get to the funeral. That it was a it was a funeral place, a field where they they buried the homeless. He was a veteran, so they, he got that free. And, uh, and it was just provided he got that box from the funeral director, brought that home to my dad, who's his brother. And my dad, somehow when my dad passed away, that box came to me. And I thought, this is all that's left of a man who the parents tried to raise him right. He had heard God's word numerous times, but he never listened. However, we don't know if he might have one day listened before he died. You know, he could have. And so, I, I just say that, the reason I said that is because this policeman cared enough that he wanted, he didn't want, he wanted to stop this process of homeless, homelessness for this guy. At least of sleeping out on the road. And, and you and I can make a difference. We should be able to make a difference. I want to make a difference. But you know, you, uh, the clothing thing, that, you know, you can watch people and you know which one is living for the Lord and has a godly attitude. You can tell whether they're of God or not. That's right. And it might be that some of them are a little bit more well off than others, but their hearts may be really on track and targeted for God. And but then again, you've got some people that want to tell people how they should dress or need to dress in order to try to minister to them. You know, and like this man that came to me, he said, you don't need to wear a suit and tie. I don't. He didn't last long either. A year and a half or two, he was gone. See, the same one that told you you didn't need an education either. You didn't need to go to school. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I went back to a, one of my other churches when we were between churches. I was an outreach director of the church, but I realized God was still calling me into the pastor, and I want and He wanted me to stay in it because I backed away a little bit, and because uh, it's tough not pastoring sometimes. And so I went to my a church I'd pastored before in Sydney, and a guy that was preaching who was visiting said I, and he saw that I was there, and all of a sudden his message changed. You know, did you ever see anything like that happen? Because I was there, and he knew me. And he knew I was a previous pastor. And he said, you know, I don't know about these people that think they need to go to school to learn how to preach. They don't have to go to school. God will fill their mouths with the words. Well, I, 
You know, I didn't say anything. I just sat there and listened to him because everybody that knew me knew that I had studied and had gone to theological school and had started in seminary also, ran out one, after one year, went to the military, got a GI Bill, got paid for it. But anyway, that's my life. But afterwards, I talked to the guy, and he's just a young guy, you know, one of those guys, young guys that kind of uh, thinks he knows too much. But anyway, I walked out there on the porch when, when people were out of earshot a little bit, and I said, I want you to know something. Paul was a very educated man. And he said, we should, we should be servants of God. We should know the Word, study the, the Word that we would, might be approved to, to preach the Word. Um, that we would not be ashamed. And, and he knew seven different languages, and probably fluently. And he was one of the smartest. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Roman citizen. He was uh, chosen to lead groups of people to arrest Christians. I mean, he was, and he sat at the feet of the leading philosopher of the day, Gal, uh, Galileo, or Gamaliel. And was it Gamaliel? I think it was anyway. I need to go back to school on this. What? Gamaliel. Gamaliel, right? Gamaliel. Say it, pronounce it for me. Gamaliel. Gamaliel, anyway. But anyway, he was, you know, I, I is graduated. I is and I are graduated. Anyway, so here he was, and I told this young man that, and he's going, did he not know that? Listen, we don't have to be uneducated and think that that we need to be and that that's, that is a something that we should be. We should try to prepare ourselves. You know what my grandfather told me? You know when my grandfather started preaching? When he was 40 years old. Do you know why he waited that long? Because he couldn't read. And he felt like he was not, he'd been, he'd been called to preach, but he was not going to do it. And he told me, Tony, the reason I waited so long to preach was because I couldn't read. I had to teach myself how to read before I could preach. And and I said, well, I don't want to wait that long. I mean, I, I don't, I've got people I want to reach right now. So I went to school to learn the Word so I didn't have to study it for five, six, ten years before I would go preach. And and so this is, this is what he told me, though. And he realized, you know how God got his attention? This is all extra tonight. How did God get my grandfather's attention? He was holding back on God. He wasn't getting busy learning to read the Bible because he didn't know how to read. He ended up teaching himself. And he did learn. God got his attention. He had a guy, he had a boy. His name was Delano. He was just about a year or two younger than my mother. And it was Christmas time. And his and that my grandfather's brother Lawrence got a shotgun for Christmas. And they they were in town or at a crossroads somehow and uh, and they were talking and he was showing him his shotgun. Lawrence was showing Delano his shotgun and they parted and were walking different directions. And all of a sudden Delano said something to him. Lawrence turned around to see what he said. The shotgun hit his thigh when he turned and shot him right in the chest. That was the apple of my grandfather's eye. He loved him dearly. And he went to the woods, stayed up there two days, and prayed, grieving. And God showed him, you know, you can't be mad at your, your brother. It's not his fault. It's your fault. Because you've rebelled against me. You've been disobedient. You brought this on. Delano was saved. Delano was going to heaven. He went to heaven. But you are being disobedient. Now listen, God will allow things to happen. Satan loves it when he can take, when he can kill God's people. You know, he loves it. He'll do it. But I'm just saying, God can get your attention. You believe that? Yeah. He can do it. How many of you has he gotten your attention? Yeah, yeah he does, don't he? Mm -hmm. Carol, you're awfully quiet. Tell us a little bit. How did God get your attention? Huh? I was raised in a Christian home. You were raised in a Christian home. They beat you in this admission. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Spare not the rod, thou shalt save thy child from hellfire. <laughs> but it is in there. But you know, God knows how to get our attention. 
And so anyway, let me, I digress. Go ahead, Jerry. I say that because, listen, we shouldn't be all about what we wear. It shouldn't be about what we wear. It should be what our heart condition is. It should, should be where our heart is. People should be able to tell where our heart is when we're speaking, when we're teaching, when we're working. No matter what we're doing, our heart should tell people by what we say and how we act who we are. It's not about the clothes. Who we are in Jesus. Who we are in God. Who we are. Where that's, right, that's what I'm saying. Where your heart is, yeah, where you are. And so, and where and God's word says something about there. About where our heart is is where people know what we're about. So when we see this, um, we, we know that there were people out there that were, maybe they, maybe some of them did look real, extremely attractive, uh, real powerful, or and had a, a voice and, and had the elegance. Paul said that this, this, I, I'm, I'm, I might come across rude to you because they've heard probably a lot of fancy preachers, eloquent speakers, but... Uh, he, he was saying that he was not about that. By the way, what did Paul call himself before he came to know the Lord? He, 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 he said, my life before Christ was like a pile of dung. A pile of, dung. A pile of poopy. That's what that means. He said, before Christ, my life wasn't worth anything. And, and I, he said, I thought I was all this. And he began to give his pretensions. He grew the Hebrews and uh, he was a Pharisee. He knew the word, the law, in and out, backwards and forwards. He knew it. And some think he was on the Sanhedrin. I don't know if we can verify that, but he probably was. Very, because he got chosen by the Jews to go and lead a group of people to kill the Christians, the unbelieving Jews. So when you think about these things, Paul was very, very educated. Now, can God use educated people? Do you think, don't you think God might want us to have some education? Sure. Could could Paul have ever reached all these Grecian Grecian cities if he didn't know their language? You know, Greek. He knew there were seven languages he knew. So he could go through these cities and talk to people on their level, their way, and be able to to get the point across. Okay, go ahead, Terry. I'm going to digress again. Uh, we're going to be getting into verses 16 through 21, but I just want to kind of summarize what we've just covered here. It talks about uh, Paul... Uh, war, yeah, Paul warned that uh, just as Satan can masquerade as an angel of light, the false apostles can also masquerade uh, as God's good angels. So he could empower false Paul, he could empower false apostles to masquerade this, so the Corinthian Christians could get confused on that. It says it takes discernment to see beneath the mask of an imposter, and that's comes out of the uh, second chapter of Revelation. And it goes on to say, Christians must cultivate that discernment uh, may be abiding in what they know to be true. Galatians chapter 1 on that. So discernment is very important. That would be a whole message right there just talking about discernment. So let's continue on now with uh, verse 16. Where does discernment come from then, Terry, would you say I mean, who gives us discernment in our in our life? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's right. So through the Holy Spirit, we can understand things. Do, do you remember when you came to know the Lord? How all of a sudden the Word began to make sense? Isn't that amazing how that happened? No coincidence, because the Holy Spirit was working with our hearts, and we'd probably read it and heard it so many times. But but when we accepted the Lord, the Holy Spirit living within us helped us to have the true meaning of God's Word. I think it's amazing, and. The Holy Spirit knows how to apply it to whatever we're going through in our lives. I think that's amazing, don't you? Go ahead, Terry. Okay, verse 16 says, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this, con in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take, you, take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on 
uh, the faith, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit, where, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. So in this, it's easy to get a sense of Paul's sarcasm and some of his hesitancy in this case to protect himself. He would rather be talking about Jesus, but because of the situation here, uh, uh, it, the message would hinder the Corinthian Christians, so uh, there was some disregard of Paul's credentials as the true apostle, as the true representative of Jesus. See, uh, I'm glad you brought that out, Terry, because sometimes you may have to share your credentials with somebody else about your new life in Christ. And it might be that you just have to give your salvation experience. That's one of the best things we can do to share our credentials of being a Christian. We can share that with somebody. Here's, you know, we God saved us. And like the blind man said, I they were asking, well, what why were you following Christ? And 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 they wanted to try to get him to denounce Christ. He said, Well, this one thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. Now can you argue with that? It's pretty hard to argue. And, and I once was lost, but now I'm found. I mean, can you argue with anybody about their salvation when they say they know they're saved? With their salvation, they know it. And, and if they know it, and what God is doing or has done in their lives. So this is what Paul was saying. You know, if you need to hear a little bit about me, he said, if you're listening to foolish people anyway, well, let me just tell you what uh, I may appear as a fool to you. I'll suffer about it, but uh, this is... You, I, I want you to understand and listen to him. He was trying to get their attention. And he did get their attention. Because sometimes it's necessary for us to be able to show that we cared enough about what God wanted us to do. That we were willing to get prepared. If you're going to do something for God, don't you think you need to be prepared? Well, he tells us to study. To show ourselves. Study to show yourself approved. A work that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. That's right. And that's what God's Word says. We've got to study to show ourselves approved. I was talking to Mike. I was talking to uh, James and uh, Steve. But I like what Mike said. He, I said, you know, I need some I need some trustees here. I can't do everything on my own. Got hurt getting on the pickup truck, taking that piano out to get it fixed to, Columbia, to uh, Fort Wayne. Standing out here on the ladder. Can't walk for several days after that. Missed four days of work. Listen, I need help. I mean, what does God have to do to hit me on the head to show me, hey, you know, you're trying to do too much yourself. Get some help. And so I asked these guys if they're going to. You know what Mike asked? What does a trustee do? And that's what you're supposed to wonder. Okay, yeah, I might do it, but what does he do? And a trustee you know, is responsible for the property and and uh, to for uh, to as a check and balance system about... What's going on here in the church? What needs to be done? Where can we have the money? Can the money be gotten? Can we? You know, I have trustees. So you've got trustees on bank boards. You know, you've got trustee and trustees and businesses. The the church has to operate. We have a mortgage. We've got expenses. We've got an electric bill, a gas bill. We we make this possible so people can come in and hear the word, and we try to be a light to the community. But it takes people that are willing to to be workers. So anyway, that's a little bit about uh, kind of how this relates to this. Paul is saying, well, you, you want I want you to hear. You're willing to listen to other people about crazy, silly things, foolishness. So I'm just going to tell you. I've got some things to say here. How do you think Paul was able to get their attention? Is that the way he did it? Did it work? Must have, yeah, it did. Because the ministry continued and it kept growing, and they were even willing to support him and his and his uh, of the other apostles and those that were with him and his team and go on out to other churches and help the needy churches too. So anyway, it's it's a good thing to learn these things. They may think you're foolish, but they can't argue with your testimony about what God has done for you. You got to remember that. First thing I learned when I went to theological school, you know. Sometimes we just let, need to let people know we've got a testimony. What God has done for us, 
They could argue about a whole lot of things. You remember the movie Doctari? Well, <laughs> wait a minute. Some of you do, Doctari. You remember the TV series, Doctari? Yeah. This guy was a he was a doctor. <laughs> he was a doctor in Africa, and they instead of calling him doctor, they called him Doctari. And there was a, a movie written, I think, about it, and then a TV series made from it. And he had he would go into one of the best, and I can't remember which medical school, probably Harvard, I think, but uh, studying to be a surgeon, and he was really doing well. And he had all opportunity to be one of the leading ones in the United States, if not the world. And and so, but when he was in college, some, some of his friends got a hold of him. Or I don't know, by the medical school, medical school by that time. And they were saying, well, a Christian talked to him. And he said, you know what? This Christian <coughs> stuff is foolishness. I'm going to study this book you call the Bible, and I'm going to prove to you that it's false. Well, you know what happened. God got a hold of him, and he realized how true it was. In fact, lots of things that the doctors study have a basis right in the Bible, you know, and you can't get away from it. So the more he studied, the more he found, well, God's word is true. He accepted the Lord and went to be a doctor, fabulous doctor over there. I think it was Africa. Yeah, Doctari, and that's what the, the thing was written about. But, uh, but So it might have seemed foolishness to him, but God got a hold of him anyway. I can't believe nobody knows that. That's serious. How many of you have ever heard of Doctari? You've heard of it. You? Yeah, yeah, okay. Anybody else? Where were you? <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's digress again. Go ahead. Okay, I saw you stood there. That's where you stood up. No? <laughs> what? Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, you wrap this up, would you, Terry? Okay, um, Paul's going to get deeper in his, in his boasting with us. He's not done yet. So that's what we have lying ahead for next uh, Wednesday when we get ready to meet. I mean, it's, it's going to get pretty deep up here. But we, ought, we need to remember, Paul really doesn't like to boast about himself. He must rather, much rather boast about Jesus Christ. And it talks a little bit about that in uh, 2 Corinthians backing up into chapter 4. So there we kind of realize... He's got to remind the Corinthian Christians, hey, look, let's go back and take a look. Now i got to rehash everything all about myself and let you know and get you back on board, clear your mind of all the false things that you've been listening to, and get back with Jesus Christ again. So that's kind of where we are here at this point. It's, Paul's not done yet, and that's what we're going to get into next week. But he was willing, if he needed to, he was willing to look like a fool to reach those foolish people that were failing to listen. And that's important. Sometimes we have to sometimes we have to forget about what people are thinking about us and just tell people what God wants us to tell them. God has always had a place for his people. For his preachers that are preaching the truth, he'll always make a place and always make an opportunity and a time. Right, Terry? And so, and that's what Paul was, was doing. He, well, I'm going to preach the word. You need to hear it. You may think me foolish, but you're listening to a lot of foolish stuff. So I might as well share with you what I've got to say. Not nearly as foolish as what they were hearing before. Is it? All right. Thank you, Jerry. Oh, sorry. Closing a word of prayer? Yes, please do. Okay. Anyone wish to close? Go ahead, Susan. <clears throat> and dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer tonight. Lord, you say that when more more than one people come together and worship you and pray with you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. You hear our prayers and singly too as well, Lord. That we, we thank you for providing this building for each and every one of us to come and worship you and to learn about you yes, and through our pastor and through other people in the group as well too. We ask you to be with those who who um need strength and encouragement and guidance and especially those people who are hurting right now in the hospital especially this young woman's um, father's uh, girlfriend. Lord, she needs you. She needs you to heal her. Heal her, Lord, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet and everywhere in between, Lord. You raise her body up, Lord, and heal her like you are our physician and our healer. And we thank you for, the, for what you do for us. We ask you to lead each and every one of us in our daily lives to understand your will and not our own. 
and we thank you for the opportunity to have a church that where we can come together and praise you and sing songs to you and love you as you want us to and be the Christians you want us to be. I thank you for everything you've done in my life as well, Lord, and I praise you for what you will do in the future. I ask you to show each and every one of us our purposes in life, and your will will be done in that, in that avenue, Lord. We thank you and praise you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name and blood of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Well, I do want to remind you, or in fact, you have, if you haven't heard, but I don't think most of you have, that Nancy, the lady that we took the piano to, we took it to a Sweetwater to get them to fix it. And uh, what they did was they taught her how to put things on the hard drive so we don't have to rely on that uh, those floppies because the floppy disk reader is not working. And they said it wasn't worth upgrading because it's obsolete. So they taught her how to do it at Spencer, uh, the was what Sweetwater. And when they did, uh, after that, Saturday, we went and took the piano to her house so she could put the hymn on on the piano, which I think is great. She has a request. Her son-in-law, beautiful, wonderful family that love the Lord, uh, the, kids, the kids, they all sing as a family and everything. He works at a, at a children's home type place, a Christian children's home, and a teacher and administrator there, and uh, he's got cancer. He's only like 45 years old at the most. And I, I called his I called Nancy, and I talked to Nancy today, and she handed the phone to his wife, Ashley. And we prayed together, all three of us, about, about the, the young man, Matthew, who's uh, got cancer. And it's pretty serious. So if you can remember Matthew and Ashley, their family, they got kids from 7 to 13 years of age. You know, a bunch of them, and they're just a beautiful family. They love the Lord. But uh, anyway, just keep that in your, in your prayers, if you will. Matthew has had surgery today. I will find out after after I get home uh, what how it went. But uh, they think they've got a plan, but you know we don't know. So we don't know how that is right now. So anyway, uh, thank you. By the way, if I do say some words at Gamaliel, that's how I, I was taught by Southern teachers. I'm going to have their Southern prayer. I'm going to have their southern accent when I say some words. I have to get illegal. But anyway. One song that's not in the hymnal. What is it? Fly away. I noticed that. Why is it not in our hymnal? I don't know. 